That's not loud enough and everybody said I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight Those of us in our various congregations And those online Anywhere you are You want to give this period Maximum attention I don't allow anything to sidetrack you We're going to have a great moment before the Lord By the way, we're now on our way to divine solution for all Divine solution for you I want to tell you that from this week Friday Something you've never heard Something you've never seen in your personal life and in your family something great is coming to you and the lord is going to bring solution to every area of your life there are seven areas of your life and it's connected with the seven redemptive name of god i won't talk about it now meet me at papa ground as we connect face to face and online and I'm going to tell you how a perfect solution is going to come in your life is coming your way I'll be there where are you I'll be there your voice is like somebody who has not eaten for three days I will be there I'll meet you there, you meet me there, and great will be what the Lord will do in every life in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, we thank you at this time, and we bless your name for the Bible study of today. We're asking, O oh Lord, you open the pages of the scriptures to every one of us in Jesus' name. Open our hearts and grant us, Lord, great new shining a deep revelation in your word in jesus name we well, thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus mighty name we pray god bless you we're coming to first corinthians chapter 16 and today we're looking at verses 5 through to 12. let's start with verse 5 it tells us in first corinthians chapter 16 reading from verse 5 now i will come unto you when i shall pass through macedonia for i do pass through macedonia i want you to stop there for a moment communication writing communication started was speaking i meet my neighbor you meet your neighbor and then you tell them something in the language they can't understand, communication. And then you progress to writing. And we know about the writing. God himself wrote the Ten Commandments and gave to Moses. And then commanded Moses to write all the scriptures from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And then we have the whole Bible now, communication by writing. But now communication has increased we now have communication through our cell phone we can send a text and then we have communication we can interact with people and give them the word and give them the gospel and give them something beneficial through the social media but then the social media cannot solve all the problem paul the apostle said i will come you have to give feet to your communication and in the church today there are some people that think all they receive all the instruction all the revelation they receive will be through social media my brother my sister that does not complete everything the body of christ must understand that we put feet to our communication and there is still the face-to-face -face interaction there are things in the church the lord has commanded us to do that the that the social media alone cannot do it's like going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and you're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and then he said 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You cannot do water baptism on the social media. The church will still have to come together. We go beyond the writing. We go beyond the Instagram. We go beyond all the handles of the social media. We have to come together in the physical for water baptism to take place. And then on that final night, he took bread and he gave it unto them. Take it and do this in my remembrance. And then he gave them the cup and they drank. And then he said, drink ye all of it. As long as you do this, as often as you do this, you do this this in my name and then you show my death until I come again you cannot do the Lord's Supper the Holy Communion through social media we still have to come together it tells us where to fellowship together and fellowship one on one and then with the church and so Paul the Apostle said Yes, writing, communication. And then he said, all the same, even though I can write to you, there are things I cannot communicate to you only by writing, only by communication. I will come unto you. And for those of us who are still at home and will think I have the gospel, I have the revelation, I have everything, and then I don't need to go to church, you have to come. I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia. Come over to Macedonia and help us. He went to Macedonia and he helped them. And then he said, I'm passing through again. After we have preached the gospel, after the global crusade, then we interact with the people, those who are born again, and those who give their lives to the Lord. There is the discipleship. There is the follow-up, and we continue continue with that saying, I will pass through, I will pass through, for I do pass through Macedonia. Today as we look at these verses we're studying, I'm talking on diligently doing God's work in God's will. Diligently, not haphazardly, not weakly, not, you know, heartlessly, but with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, diligently doing God's work in God's own way. And there are three points we're looking at. Number one, purposefully witnessing and working with God amidst adversaries. There might be difficulties, there might be challenges, there might be stumbling blocks, and there might be some thistles and thorns in the way. But all the same, we pass through those thorns and we're purposefully witnessing and working with God amidst adversaries. Point number two is passionately working as a workman with God. Passionately working as a workman with God like the apostle. That's talking about Timothy. And the Paul the apostle said, concerning Timothy, he walketh the work of God like I do. That's a man that had sorry to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. Point number two, passionately walking as a workman with God like the apostle. Point number three is patiently waiting. There are times it causes us to stay. Other times it causes us to go. There are times it causes us to run. Other times we say, hold on, don't go there yet. And we're patient, patiently waiting in the wisdom of God with Apollos. Patiently waiting in the wisdom of God with Apollos. Let's come to point number one. In point number one, we're looking at purposely witnessing, purposefully witnessing and working with God amidst adversaries. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we're reading from verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 5. Now, I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Have you noticed there the use of the word pronoun I? I will come. I shall pass through. 
I do pass through Macedonia. Paul the apostle was a person that uh, yes, he had other people, Timothy, Titus, Silas, Barnabas, and all the people, but he didn't wait. Suppose they don't go with me. Suppose they are not coming with me. I will come. Suppose there's no helper. Suppose there's no support. I will pass through. Suppose there is no prayer partner. Suppose there's no preaching partner. I do pass through Macedonia. He did not allow the slackness of other people to hinder his own progress in the mission, in the vision that the Lord had given him. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that she may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. And then in verse 7, it says in verse 7, For I personal, I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you. If the Lord permit, he puts everything, I have the plan, if the Lord permit, I have the goal, if the Lord permit, I have the ideal, if the Lord permit, I have my aspirations, the places I want to go, but on the basis of the will of God for, for the moment, if the Lord permit, and then in verse, in verse 8, it says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Have you noticed that Paul the Apostle is a man of great plan? He didn't just say, okay, I don't have any plan. I don't have anything I want to do. The Spirit of God will lead me and then will guide me anytime he wants to. He plans. I'll get to Rome. I'll get to Macedonia. I'll get to Philippi. I'll get to Ephesus. And then this is the place I will be until the time of Pentecost. You must have a plan. And it is a plan you are following. You are taking inventory. You are checking up. Am I where I have planned? I would like to be. Let's look at verse 9. Then in verse 9, for a great door, an effectual is opened unto me. And there are many adversaries. And there are many adversaries. The adversaries are working for their master, Satan. I'm working for my master, the Lord Jesus Christ. The adversaries are working for darkness. I am working for the light. The adversaries, and they're working and they're moving fast to a lost eternity. I am moving fast to an eternity of joy and bliss and happiness and reward. And if the adversaries are faithful, in serving the devil if the adversaries are faithful and they are passionate and they are diligent in serving the devil then i must be as passionate as diligent as determined to serve my lord for a great dawn and effectual is opened unto me and there are many adversaries that's purposefully witnessing and purposely purposefully working with God amidst adversaries now Paul the apostle knew that he had a purpose for his calling the Lord called him for a purpose and he was going to fulfill that purpose uh, what's the purpose Acts of the Apostles chapter 26 and we're reading from verse 15 and I said what thou Lord and he said I am Jesus whom thou persecutest he was a persecutor then he became a preacher this man was converted you cannot doubt his conversion. He was going on the road and like an enemy, enemy of Christ, enemy of the gospel, enemy of the salvation of the people of God. But now he turned around. He was not a persecutor anymore. I ask you a question. Are you converted? Can you tell about that conversion? He always said, I was on my way on the road to the Damascus. And he knew the spot, he knew the day, he knew the time, he knew what happened when he was converted. Can you tell the time? Can you tell the day? Can you tell the moment? 
Can you tell of the change of the transformation that happened when you were converted? He said, then in verse 16, in verse 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Underline that word, this purpose, this purpose purposefully witnessing and purposefully walking with God amidst adversaries have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which I will appear in the which I will appear unto thee and then he tells us in verse 17 delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Have you noticed something here? Paul was not ordained by Apostle Peter. Paul was not ordained by Apostle John. Paul was not ordained by the twelve. But the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I send thee. Jerusalem did not know about that. And the church of the Jews at that time did not know about that. But the Lord assured Paul, I've ordained you. I've appointed you. I have called you. I have put you in place. And I'm sending you forth that will bear fruit. I send thee. You must understand that you are not waiting for a dream. You are not waiting for a sound of voice from anywhere. The Lord himself, as he called you to repentance, and he called you to salvation, he called you to soul winning. I sent thee. And then in verse 18, here is what is to do, the purpose of his life, and the purpose of his calling, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. Paul the Apostle knew telling stories, even Bible stories, that's not enough. You get them to understand all I've seen that come short of the glory of God. You get them to understand that only through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary can we be saved and forgiven and set free. You will tell them here is the purpose of your calling that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. Look at the testimony of Paul the Apostle in verse 19. In verse 19 it says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Heavenly vision, heavenly mission, heavenly commission, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Why are we reading this? Why are we studying this? For you to understand, as God called Paul, he has called it to as God sent forth Paul, he has sent you forth you. As he gave him the gospel and he gave him the message of salvation, he has given that to you too. And he has told you to go and take that to the people around you. And you must not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 1. We're reading from verse 13. It says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you. I purposed to come unto you. You see, if the Lord, as the Lord has given you a calling, you must have a purpose. And it's good if it is reaching down. And it is good if you monitor each every time. And it is good if you are asking yourself how much of the plan of God and the purpose of God and the calling of God am I fulfilling? And then you purpose, you determine, and you search a goal and you plan all the people he has sent you to one by one and continent by continent, community to community, you are making the plan. And Paul the Apostle said, often times, I purpose to come unto you. 
but was hindered, was led hitherto. And when you come, what are you coming to do? That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And now he says in verse 14, he says, I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He says, I count myself a debtor, and it's witchy on me every day, and I must discharge my duty, and I must pay my debt. And he says, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, and both to the wise and to the unwise. Then in verse 15, he tells us so, as much as in me is, I am ready. They stoned him in Iconium, the other place, I am ready. There was persecution in Lystra the other time. I am ready. He was imprisoned in Philippi. I am ready. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life down to me because I have a purpose. I have a goal that I will fulfill what the Lord has called me for to preach the gospel of the grace of God everywhere. And so he said, as much as in me is, while I'm still breathing, while I'm still alive, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Then he tells us in verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. When I was a sinner, I was not ashamed of the Sanhedrin. When I was a sinner, I was not ashamed of being a Pharisee. When I was a sinner, I was not ashamed of being a persecutor. I carried that thing on my head. I carried it on my shoulders. I carried it on my mind. And I went everywhere without any shame. I did that in darkness and in error. Now, I come to the light. Now, Jesus spoke to me directly. Now Jesus ordained me and sent me forth. If I wasn't ashamed doing the work of Satan, I could I be ashamed now doing the work of God? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And now he tells us in verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Revealed the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Faith for salvation. Faith for sanctification. Faith for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Faith for the outpouring of the power of the Holy Ghost upon our life. Faith for healing. Faith for deliverance. Faith for having and possessing all the provisions of God. Because therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Understand, Paul was a man of purpose. And he had passion for that purpose. He had determination, diligence for that purpose. And he didn't allow anything, adversaries, hurdles, stumbling blocks, the Jews, persecution, anything to hinder him from fulfilling that purpose. In fact, as he was talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 10, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, purpose, is the anchor of every other thing in life. 
you may know doctrine if you don't have purpose the doctrine will just be inside you you will not bring it out you may have a distinguishing or distinguished manner of life if you don't have any purpose that will just be a private thing and you may have faith and the faith will be private if there is no purpose long suffering charity patience is the purpose that anchors everything what's your purpose in life when you come to the edge of the journey what do you want to be remembered for what do you want people to say he was a man of one goal a man of one ideal a woman of one assignment a boy a girl of one duty what do you want to be remembered for the purpose of your life the things you do are you just doing merry-go-round are you just uh, walking and there's no goal there's no ideal there's no purpose you must purposefully determine and commit yourself to witnessing and walking with God in spite of the persecution look at what it says over there in verse 11 in verse 11 my persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord delivered me and now he is going to go from himself Paul and it's going to go to all the people of God. He has said, you know my doctrine, you know my manner of life, you know my purpose, and you know all that I've gone through my persecution is going to now transfer or just migrate to what it should be for the people. It tells us in verse 12, it says, Ye, and all that will live godly, all that will live godly the people that have the, the same doctrine with paul and the same manner of power, power of a manner of life with paul and the same a kind of purpose determination yes with paul all that will live godly in christ jesus shall suffer persecution i pray whatever persecution comes you'll not give up i will not give up and the Lord who helped Paul the Apostle, and he gave him all the grace that he needed. And, his, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. It will abundantly stop your life with grace, sufficient grace, in Jesus' name. A good amen. Look at First Corinthians chapter 16. We're reading from verses 7 and 8. It says in verse 7, But I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust. I trust in the Lord, but I trust. All things being equal, but I trust for the grace of God and the promises of God, but I trust to tarry a while with you. If the Lord permit, if the Lord permit, if the Lord permit always understand you have a good plan if the Lord permit you have a good project if the Lord permit and you have a good aspiration if the Lord permit you have a good goal a goal getter yet you must always say if the Lord permit look at verse 8 now in verse 8 but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost on condition that's the will of God on condition if the Lord permit in James chapter 4 reading from verse 15 James chapter 4 verse 15 but that ye that ye ought to say if the Lord will we shall live and do this or that you will always say if the Lord will if the Lord permit, I want to follow this career. I want to travel to that place. I want to send my children overseas. I want to get this for my boy. I want to get this for my daughter. I want to relocate and build a house in the suburb. 
and I want to go to our stage. I want to go and settle down. If the Lord permit, everything we plan, everything we want to do, all the projects we want to face, you will say, we shall live and do this or that if the Lord will. And then in verse 16, it tells us, but now you rejoice in your postings. All such rejoicing is evil. All the bragging, I will do this. And you don't factor God into your equation. And you don't say, I'm going to do that only on the grounds that God permits. He says such boosting and such planning that doesn't have God's will and God's permission in it is evil. Verse 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Look at that. It's sin. There are some people that will say, you know, I will rise and do something if the Lord permits. I will rise and preach and I will go here, I will go there if, God, if the Lord will. And God has not spoken to me. And because God has not spoken to me, and I don't want to do anything that God has not spoken about, so I am sitting down all the time. Somebody is hungry and you have the food and you can give him the food, but I've not heard the voice of God. Somebody needs the gospel and you have the gospel and you know to connect with him. I've not heard from God. He said, if you're using that excuse, if the Lord will, if the Lord permit, and you know to do good, and you do it not, for you it is sin. He wants us to understand there are things God has ordained and God has commanded. This is what to do. And we're not waiting for a voice from heaven. We're not waiting for any revelation. We know, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me. A great door. Look at the great door before us that is open. Look at this a global crusade, worldwide crusade that is happening. Look at the thing the Lord has put in your hand with your smartphone, with Android. You can do a lot. A great door is opened unto you. And look at all the evangelism uh, nudges that, you know, we're now showing on Monday. And look at the encouragement and the inspiration. And it's just for you to take that and send it to a friend. A great door is opened unto you. If you were maybe shy or you were timid, you didn't know how to share the gospel before now, it's in your hand. It just taking like that um, a publicity for the a divine solution for all crusade and then send it to somebody, send it to another one and then text uh, a sentence or two and say hi about this, I believe you are coming I believe you are connecting and every message we hear you can easily put the units on the YouTube every time, immediately the messages are given they are available on the YouTube it's available now for every Everyone. You can reach people here in your country. You can reach people in another country. You can reach people even of another language. A great door and effectual is open unto everyone. And there are many adversaries. Sometimes the adversaries are not like lions on the street. The adversaries are not like tigers on the street that will crush us and destroy us. It may be a literal feeling of tiredness. It may be procrastination. It may be kind of a weakness. It may be that you are just careless. All those enemies, all those adversaries of our progress will brush out of the way and will go through the open door in Jesus' name. Is anybody saying amen tonight? 
Acts of the Apostles chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 19 verse 8. And, we, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. Look at verse 9. And when divers were hardened and believed not, but speak evil of that way before the multitude, those are the adversaries, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily, disputing daily, witnessing daily, uh, preaching daily, sharing the gospel daily. That's uh, possible for us now. We cannot say because today is Monday or it is Tuesday or because it is Saturday or because it's Sunday. We cannot reach people now. Do you know that people check their phone almost every five minutes? The research that was conducted shows that the average person, they will check off uh, either they are looking at Facebook or they are looking at, uh, you know, their text or they are looking at WhatsApp. Every four minutes, they check their phone. And every time, they are glued to their phone. Have you noticed the Emma, if they are walking on the phone, if they are walking on the road, sometimes they are listening to something you know, on the phone. If they are in the bus, in the taxi, they are not even looking at where they are going. Uh, they are checking their phone. They are clicking something. Everyone is on phone now almost every time and so we can do this daily if they're listening every time if they're checking every time we can send a message to them too and occupy them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ you will I said you will say I will I can I must you will do it in Jesus' name. Disputing daily in the school of one tyrannous. Look at verse 10. It says, And this continued by the space of two years. This continued by the space of two years. This new gadget where you see now. All these are social handles. What if we're sending a text every day for two years? And then the person will send it to, will say, pass this one on. Don't let this message die on your phone. And don't let it be hidden there. Pass it on. And the person it gets to will tell that person, pass it on. If all the members of this church, in this country, in this continent of Africa, in Europe, America, everywhere, if everyone that has heard the message if they will pass it on to another person who has not heard. And that person will pass it on to somebody else who has not heard. If we can continue that, if Jesus tarries by the space of two years, our world will change. I said our world will change. You'll be part of it. I will be part of it. I said, I will be part of it. And make sure you make your consecration commitment unto, unto the Lord. And remember every day and continue. It says, but the space of two years, so that all they that dwelt in Asia, all, all, all they that dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. What will happen? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Now it's now your turn. What are you? You will do it. And you know what some people have done? They take those crusade messages and prayers that are so powerful, and then the sick are healed, blind eyes are open, they caught that prayer. And then they send it to somebody who is suffering, somebody who is sick, and the miracles will continue. I did hear your amen. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And then in verse 11, in verse 12, it says, So that from his body were brought unto the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons. Paul 
was not there, handkerchiefs and apron, Paul may not be there, and I may not be there, but text and Twitter, everything was sending to them the prayer, the power, the anointing, and miracles will be taking place everywhere in Jesus' name. And the diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. A new door is opened unto you. I said a new and effectual door is opened unto you. You will make use of it at this time of opportunity in Jesus' name. Point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at passionately working as a workman with God, like the apostle. Oh, we're looking at First Corinthians chapter 16. Look at verse 10 now. If Timothy come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he walketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Timothy, a trainee, a member, somebody, a follower, a disciple, a learner who is still learning, he walketh. He didn't wait for Paul the Apostle to die before he started walking. He didn't want, he didn't, he didn't wait for Paul the Apostle to retire until he would start walking. He learned, he practiced, he heard, then he did it, he practiced it. And it says, he walketh the work of the Lord as I also do. And then we're told in verse 11, let no man therefore despise him, despise Timothy, but conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto me. For I look for him with the brethren. By the way, who is Timothy? When was he converted? What was the means of his conversion? What was his determination, his diligence, and his consecration? Let's learn a little about Timothy. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2 to Timothy, my dear, my dearly beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, in thee, Timothy, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also the grandmother had the faith for salvation was saved, and the mother had faith for salvation was saved, and they passed that on at an early age, and Timothy also became saved. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 14. In chapter 3 verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Look at verse 15. It says, but and that from a child. Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy was converted as a child. It was in the home that the parents, the mother, the grandmother led him to faith in Christ. He repented of his sin, even as a little child became born again and retained that faith. Look at Acts chapter 16. We're reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Then came he to Debbie and Lystra, and behold, his certain disciple was there, named Timothy. A certain disciple named Timothy, already saved, already born again, already a child of God, already living the life of the Christian. A disciple named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, the mother a Jew, and believed, but his father was a Greek. That's mixed marriage. A Greek, the man, a Gentile, the man, a Jewish, 
Jew, the woman, and then out of that marriage, Timothy was born, and Timothy looked at the life of the mother, and then preferred the, the faith of the mother. Maybe you are a mother, having a, an unbelieving husband, and then you have children, and you are not bold enough to teach your young Timothy, your child Timothy, the way of the Lord, not just scripture stories, but real salvation, that Timothy will come to the Lord, even though Timothy was an uh, offspring of a gentle and a Jew, eventually he got the message of salvation and believed and was saved. If he could be saved, I bought the children of our members, brother, sister, the husband, a Christian, the wife, a Christian, the father claiming to be sanctified, and the mother claiming to be sanctified, and they have children. Is your child born again? Is your Timothy a child of God? Is your Timothy committed unto the Lord? Is your Timothy having a Christian influence, salvation influence, scriptural influence, despite all the people that are living around you? Timothy was such a person, and yet he became born again. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, which was well reported by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Then in verse 3, we're told that him will Paul have to go forth with him. And he took and circumcised him because of the Gentiles, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. This child, number one, he had conversion. Number two, he had circumcision. And it's not just the physical circumcision, he had the circumcision of the heart. For him to be willing and to follow Paul the Apostle and to go through circumcision at that age, you know that he was really committed. He had consecration. Consecration. That's what the Lord is expecting of us. That like Timothy will be people who are converted. Like Timothy will be people who are circumcised in heart. Like Timothy will be people who are sanctified. Will be people who are yielded unto the Lord. And there will be people who will follow Paul the Apostle, who will follow a leader, the leader that is following the word of God and will follow him sacrificially, even if it demands circumcision at this age. That's what the Lord is telling us and that's what the Lord is pointing out. Look at verse 4, where we have Paul and we have Timothy, and we have Silas, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which are at Jerusalem. And then in verse 5, and so are the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. We're told about this Timothy now, how he became so committed in Philippians chapter 2 verse 19. Philippians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 19, but I trust in the Lord in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you. And Timothy came to the point in his discipleship in his training, and his imbibing everything that Paul the Apostle was declaring to him that he could travel now alone with the gospel. And Paul the Apostle could say, now let's uh, divide the work into two. I'm here now, you go to Philippi. I'm here now, go to Thessalonica. I am here now, go to Corinth. I'm and uh, Timothy had the courage, and Timothy had the conviction, and Timothy had the commitment that he could now take the gospel to anywhere. Paul the apostle was sending him, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your stage. In verse 20, it says, For I have no man like-minded, like-minded like Timothy, who will naturally care 
for your stage in verse 21 for all seek their own all uh, they say they are following Paul but they have another private agenda they say they are committed to preaching and following Paul the apostle but they have another kind of a goal another kind of ideal another kind of involvement on the side they are self seeking they all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ in verse 22 it says but she know the proof of him that as a son with the father he has searched with me in the gospel I pray you'll be such a man I pray you'll be such a woman and such a member and such a disciple in Jesus name as I've told you he was the son of a mixed marriage, Jewish and Greek. But all the same, everything he learned, everything he heard, he put everything to practice. He was converted, he was consecrated, and then the old nature did not have the better part of his life. He was so committed that he was walking in the first steps of Paul the Apostle. And Paul the Apostle could commend him to people around. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 16. It says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He said, You know, Timothy, he followed to the details, point by point, step by step. You two Corinthians, every member of the church in Corinth, be ye followers of me. Look at verse 17 now. For this cause have I said unto you, Timothy, who is my beloved son. I'm faithful in the Lord, faithful, whether Paul was physically there or not, faithful in the Lord, whether everybody around him agreed with his conviction or not, faithful in the Lord, whether it was an uphill task or a slopey ground, he was faithful in the Lord. Whether it was with the Gentiles or with the Jews, faithful in the Lord. Whether it was sent to Corinth or sent to Philippi or sent to Thessalonica, faithful in the Lord. Who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach, he won't add, as I teach, he won't subtract as I teach. He won't modify as I teach. He won't mutilate as I teach. He will not water it down as I teach everywhere in every church. I pray God will give us the same commitment as he gave to that young man, Timothy, in Jesus' name. A good amen over there. Second Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 1, we're reading from verse 13. He's talking to Timothy and he's saying to Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words. Hold fast, you understand? Timothy was doing well. He wanted him to remain consistent in doing well you know there are some people they know the word of God and they're doing well and they're preaching well and they're ministering well and then you are telling them hold fast the sound a sound word why is the pastor talking to me like that doesn't he know I'm faithful doesn't he know I'm diligent doesn't know I'm holding fast already Yes, that's all right. But the word of God is telling us that Paul the Apostle still encouraged and instructed and then even um, you know, pale Timothy and said, Timothy, you know what? Hold fast the form of sound words which thou was heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 14, he said, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. I pray that same commitment the Lord will
will produce in every one of us in Jesus name you want me to say that you should say it louder amen. amen look at now second Timothy chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 5 second Timothy chapter 4 reading from verse 5 he's still talking to Timothy but watch thou in all things endure affliction Timothy, you know, I've passed through all those afflictions too. You know, my persecutions and you know, my adversity and you know, the thing I've gone through and I'm taking it to you too. As you're preaching the gospel, there may be challenges and there may be hurdles to cross. There may be persecution. What now? In all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry. That same grace that helped that uh, young man, uh, Timothy, will help you, will help me, will help all of us in Jesus' name. And the grace of God will never fail in any one of our lives. We're coming now to uh, the third point, point number three. We're looking at patiently waiting in the wisdom of God with Apollos. Here is a verse of scripture that many people do not understand. Look at this. First Corinthians chapter 16, we're reading from verse 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have a convenient time. Now, Paul the Apostle said, Apollos, you're familiar with Corinth. You've been at Corinth before. That's in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verse 1. And I want you to go back there now and strengthen them. Go back there and pray to them. I'm just coming from there. And I preach unto them. And those people, they're in different camps. Some are for Paul, some are for Apollos, and some are for Savers, for Peter, and some for Christ. And I know you have a good gift, a great gift. Go to them. And so as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come at this time. Now, let's think about Paul. Let's think about, about Apollos. And let's think about the situation here. For you to understand, I need to remind you of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. We're looking at a peculiar situation now. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For his letters, they say, I'm witty. That's Paul the Apostle. I'm powerful. But... His bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. They said about Paul the Apostle in Corinth, they said, uh huh, when he writes, he's witty and powerful. But when he comes in person, his personality, his appearance, his posture, his presence is weak and his speech. His way of communication is contemptible. You wonder, is this the one they call apostle? Is this the one they say has a great vision from heaven, revelation for the Gentiles? His speech to them is contemptible. That's Paul. Now come to Apollos. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, verse 24. In Acts, chapter 18, verse 24, here is Apollos now, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Look at verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of 
John. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, he, Apollos, mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, you see those two personalities where Paul the Apostle his appearance, his presence weak, and his speech, his communication skill, contemptible. And then you see Apollos, Apollos mighty in the scriptures, fervent in spirit, bold, aggressive, outgoing. He had a personality that was very different from that of Paul. And then the Corinthians were arguing between Paul and Apollos. Let's look at 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading from verse 11. And it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. What was their contention about? Look at verse 12. And now I, now this I say that every one of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and of Savers, and of Christ. In verse 13, is Christ divided? There was division in the church at Corinth on the personality of Paul and the personality of Apollos, on the presence of Paul and the physical appearance of Apollos, on the communication ability of Paul and the communication ability of Apollos. And that brought division to the church. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Look at chapter 3, 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 3. For ye are yet carnal, for as much as, for, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? They were polarizing the church. They were like political parties. And some people say, I am a Paul's party. Other people said, I'm a Paul's party. And he said, are you not carnal? Are you not walking? as men and then in verse 4 it says for while one says I'm of Paul and another I'm of Apollos are ye not carnal now that's the situation at Corinth and at Corinth when they had that kind of contention and Paul knew about it and Paul wrote about it and said you are carnal, you are fleshly you are like worldly politicians and you are like parties in the church and you say you have Paul you have Apollos now, Paul now told Apollos, he said Apollos you know what these people want to hear you and they respect your personality and they want you to come and use your skill, communication skill, ability and strength and your boldness and your charisma. Come to Corinth and go and come and talk to them. On the side of Paul, that was humility. He knew that this was a competitor. Not because Apollos wanted to compete, but because the Corinthians wanted to bring in human reasoning. And Paul, the apostle, said, it doesn't matter. They think I am down. They think I'm contemptible. And they think I don't know how to talk. And they think that Apollos knows how to talk. His humility made him to say, please come. Number two, it was, Apollo, it was Paul seeking God's glory alone all right if i cannot communicate with them and they will not accept everything i'm saying because they look down on me and they belittle me i don't want any glory all the glory i want is the glory of god if apollos can do it let him come apollos I'm pleading with you. Come to these people. They need to know a lot. Come and teach them. You know, Paul the Apostle, for him, it was hiding self. It was dying to self. It was self-effacing nature in him. The 
depravity of the, of the human nature and the root of sin had been taken away. And because of that, he didn't care about himself. He said, all I want, none of self, but all of God. Because of that, he said, I forget myself and Apollos the rich him better than I am and they say he can do it better Apollos please come and do it he didn't have any competitive spirit in him I'll show I have revelation I will show I met Jesus on the road to Damascus Apollos never had that I will blow my trumpet up Paul the apostle never had anything like that so he said I don't mind Apollos you can come and come and talk to the people and show them the way of God you see Paul the apostle this is a man that was really sanctified this is sanctification that he wasn't looking for anything he wasn't looking for any adulation or any kind of a praise of men he was dead to the praise of men that's why he said Apollos come and minister to them that's the side of Paul the apostle now on the side of Apollos think about this Apollos thought already the people they are lifting me up and they are putting on our great apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul the apostle wants me to come now. Those carnal people, they are going to look up at me. They are going to cheer. They are going to clap. They are going to say, welcome, Apollos. Because of the humility of Apollos, he said at this time, during this convention, uh, contention, when people are about to vote, I vote for Paul, I vote for Apollos. Uh, Paul, please excuse me at this time. Let this dust die down. Let everything go down. Because of his humility, it was humility on the side of Paul. That he said, Apollos, come at this time. It was humility on the side of Apollos. I don't want to deepen the contention. I don't want to expand the contention. I don't want to lift up myself. I cannot hide my gift. When I come in there, I will speak like I normally speak. I'll be forceful. They'll be compelled to compare me with you. I don't want any canal comparison. Now, Paul, excuse me. I don't want to come at this time. Apollos wanted just the glory of God. They're just like Paul the Apostle, none of self, but all of thee. He was dead to the praise of men as they were preaching drama and they were singing his praise. And then Paul the Apostle said, Apollos, this is the right time to come. Everybody is waiting for you and they're willing to build a camp, one for Paul, one for Apollos, and one for Silas. Come at this time. Apollos said, praise of men under my feet exalting myself under my feet that depravity of the human nature that wants exaltation at the expense of my father in the lord or paul the apostle never i cannot come at this time they want me to compete with my father do they want me to compete with paul and they are saying well paul we are for polos paul the apostle please it's not the right time for me to come it will bring unnecessary carnal competition let that contention die down and then uh, when everything is all right and we're all united and we see the unity of the church then i can come that's why it says let's come back now you understand let's come back now to first corinthians chapter uh, chapter 16 uh, and we're reading from verse 12 it says in first corinthians chapter 16 verse 12 as touching our brother our brother our brother look at the language of paul the apostle he didn't say my competitor he didn't didn't say my you know brother who is going to take the ministry away from me and now the church is divided and I stayed here for 18 months to plant this church and look at what Apollo has done he has divided the church he said as touching our brother <clears throat> Apollos I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren but his will was not to come at this time was not at all to come at this time but paul did not say <clears throat> thank you very much paul did not say well apollos that's right of you never 
never think of coming to Corinth. Actually, I was testing you. I was, want, I was wanting to know what you were going to do when I greatly desired you to come unto Corinth. And it's all right you have that uh, understanding now that you don't want to come because they'll reach you above me. So make up your mind now you will never come to Corinth not Paul the Apostle. You know, when all you are looking for is the glory of God and the expansion of the kingdom and the preaching of the gospel, you're happy that there's an Apollos there. You're happy there's a Timothy there. You're happy there's a Silas there. You're happy there is a Silvanus there. You're happy for all the people that are able to contribute something. And he said, he's not coming up, but I can assure you, I'm going to keep on putting pressure on him i'm going to keep on telling him don't hide your gift and don't hide behind any excuse because of this corinthians he will come when he will have a convenient time we've learned a lot today and i pray that everything we have learned the grace of god will write upon the tables of our heart self will die competition will die and carnality will die like Paul, like Apollos to expand the kingdom of God and to preach the gospel of God without fear, without favor, the grace to do that, the Lord will give to every one of us in Jesus name and you will become and you will become and you will become a faithful preacher a faithful evangelist a faithful soul winner and all the gadgets we have available now to do the work it's in your hand you will do it i do it you do it you do it i do it and we do it together and the kingdom of god will expand in this our world in this generation in jesus name will you will you i will shout it out i will i can i must the lord make the work of god to prosper in our hands together in jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the lord in prayer everything we have learned today we have learned quite a lot let's stand up and pray that god will use us to make the gospel reach out to many people in our world.